Americans believe in today. You touched on this in one of your essays in Natural History Magazine. We'll link to that essay on pointofinquiry.org. I want to let our listeners know. You said in that essay, science is a philosophy of discovery. Intelligent design is a philosophy of ignorance. Now, I think those are pretty strong words. Well, they are, but I didn't use them just for effect. I use them because it's the simple fact of what's going on in those two enterprises. If you're a scientist and you're still in graduate school, let's say, you know, you're learning what there is to know, but all the while you're getting closer and closer to that boundary between what is known and what is not known. And that's where you plant yourself. And that's what excites you as the research scientist, because you want to discover the things that no one has ever thought of before, no one has ever seen before, no one has ever understood before. And that might even get your name associated with it. Einstein's equations, Maxwell's equations. The, the list goes on of people who have been there and done that. Now let's look at the philosophy of the intelligent design person. They go to the edge of what is known. And you know something? Maybe they're not smart enough to figure out what's on the other side of that edge. This happens to all of us. You know, you, you got to wait for a smart person to come along. But the intelligent design person is driven by a bit of hubris. That person will say, I can't understand this phenomenon. It is so complex, no one can understand this phenomenon. In fact, it is so complex that no one who will ever be born will ever understand this phenomenon. It must be the product of a higher intelligence. A supernatural intelligence. A supernatural intelligence. End of story. The person no longer looks into that chasm of unknowns to try to understand it. They turn away from it and go somewhere else. Well, you know some of the things that are in those chasms of unknown? A cure for cancer, a cure for Alzheimer's. The last person I want on that frontier is an intelligent design theorist because they will be completely useless in that exercise because they will see all the people who have failed before them, they'll give up and say, it is beyond our capacity to know. If we create a society that is driven by that philosophy of inquiry, that's the end of everything we have known and loved about the economic stability of this nation. And these are themes that you've tapped many times in many of your interviews, but I'm just another one reaffirming that fact. It's not just a simple matter of intellectual enlightenment. It has direct consequences to national security, to the economic health of this nation. You're saying that people's beliefs about origins, whether they believe intelligent design and creationism or Darwin's theory of evolution, uh, you're saying it hits people where they live and breathe, hits their wallets, has direct real-world effect. It has a direct real-world effect because it comes out of a philosophy that if there's something you don't know and can't figure out, there remains the chance that you may never figure it out. If that's how you approach what is unknown, I don't need to be in the same room with you. I'm sorry. You're, you're not going to make any discoveries. I want to be in the room with the people who are excited by that unknown. And they want to be the one to make that discovery. And you know something? If they're not smart enough to do it, they'll say to themselves, I can't wait till the person is born who is smart enough to make this discovery. And how does it affect the pocketbook? It affects the pocketbook because the frontier of scientific discovery is the greatest engine of economic growth culture has ever seen. And there's no century where that is more true than the 21st century. And so if you're going to live in a country where people shy away from advancing that frontier into the unknown, that is not the country that's going to innovate. The innovations will all take place overseas. And we will watch that happen if we don't take swift action on our own shores. Dr. Tyson, in your essay, you also mentioned something about stupid design. Uh, what do you mean by stupid design? <laughs> well, if you're going to want to run around and find things that you don't understand and claim that it's the product of a higher intelligence because of how beautifully it works or how marvelously it operates, then you ought to grant me the right to look around the same space as you are and find things that are just plain, stupidly designed. Like the fact that we as human beings breathe, eat, 
and drink through the same hole in our body, guaranteeing that some fraction of us every year will choke to death. That's just stupid design. Imagine if we had different holes in our body for that. Then you would never choke. You could drink and talk and breathe at the same time, simultaneously. You could strike from the list of causes of death choking. Okay? And your appendix, it serves no purpose other than to possibly kill you. And, and my favorite, which has been running around quite a bit, is just you ask the question, what's that going on between our legs? As they say, there's like this, there's this sewage system mixed in with an entertainment complex. <laughs> <laughs> no engineer would ever design it like that. That's just stupid design. And that's just for humans. Look at the solar system. People say, oh, Earth is, is a miracle. Excuse me, 99.9% .9 of all species that ever lived are now extinct. If you look at the fossil record, it looks like Earth is trying to kill us. Look at the tsunami that happened a few years ago in Indonesia. What's the death toll there? It was pushing 200,000 people. Every now and then the Earth burps, thousands of people die. Floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, volcanoes, tsunamis, asteroid impact. And they're all called acts of God. That's the amazing part about it. Everything that is going to kill us in an insurance form that we don't yet know how to control is called an act of God. You know, the same God that is responsible for doing things that are intelligent. So I, don't, I can't reconcile any of that. So all I'm saying is, it's not about what's intelligent and what's stupid. That's not even the point. The point is, there's enough out there that's stupid. You just have to pay attention to it to find it. And it's not hard at all to find it. And you make that list, then you're confronted with a list of stupid things and intelligent things. So if there is a designer, the designer's calling card is just as stupid as it is intelligent. So if there is intelligent design, there is also some pretty unintelligent design. I want to switch gears here. Uh, you're right. We touch on intelligent design all the time on this show. This is not a show about intelligent design, but I, I love asking the leading lights of the day about the question. I want to talk to you about your memoir, The Sky is Not the Limit. I loved it. Uh, I'd like to remind our listeners it's available through our website, pointofinquiry.org. Well, in Sky is Not the Limit, you recount how you used to go to the Hayden Planetarium as a young boy. You felt inspired by going to it. And now, well, you're the director of the Hayden Planetarium. Yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. You know, <laughs> New York City is a large place. And normally you don't have these hometown kid does good kind of story. You don't normally get that because the place is too large. But I can tell you that when I was a kid, 9, 10, 11 years old, right on up through high school, there were scientists and educators on the staff at the Hayden Planetarium, which is a part of the American Museum of Natural History here in New York, who invested their time and energy in my enlightenment, in my understanding and awareness of our place in the universe. And I've never forgotten that. And to end up back there as its director, I feel this deep sense of duty that I serve in the same capacity for people who come through the facility today that others serve for me at a time when I was most impressionable. And so I see kids of all ages come through. You know, when I walk to my office each day, I walk through the halls of the museum. I see infants in strollers. I see toddlers. I see preschoolers just learning how to ask questions about the world around them. And it's exciting to look at this trajectory of questioning. It seems like such a natural human thing to do. And like I said, I see it every day at all ages. There's a point where it shuts off in adulthood when, I don't know, I think you, you, life gets hard and you forget what it's like to wonder about our place in the cosmos. You know, psychologists talk about the day that you stop catching snowflakes in your mouth as you walk down the street. It just stops one day. You don't even remember not doing it. But all kids do it, and no adults do it. So there's some transition, and I don't know, maybe it's when life gets hard, but I see as another one of my duties to keep a flame lit or to reignite a previously extinguished flame within everybody who comes through, kids as well as adults. So they'll come out and they'll say, well, I didn't know that, and want to buy books, receive programs, come back to trigger a sense of wonder again was there for us all 